Good morning. My name is Angelina Carlton. I'm the founder of Design Your Legacy, a boutique coaching and advisory firm that helps you define, develop, and execute your personal legacy. This morning, I have the pleasure of introducing Pamela Moore. She has spent her career in the media and the events space, working as an overseeing journalist, content marketeers, and people who create conference content. She has worked in lots of business sectors from clinical medicine to electrical engineering, and now the business of cannabis, which she will talk further about today, as well as how she's working with philanthropy and also creating her own legacy. Welcome, Pamela. Thanks so much, Angelina. Happy to be here. So I am delighted to talk about this subject. We chatted a little bit previously about the, the topic. Is there a place you would like to start this morning, or should I just ask my first question? Yeah, why don't you just dive in? I'm happy to talk about whatever, but you be the guide. I think that's your skill set. Okay, wonderful. Okay, so uh, career-wise, I just would like to create a bit of an icebreaker. You had worked in the Phil Philanthropic Investment Forum before. So where did your career start and how did you find yourself here? You know, I think like a lot of women, my career path is more like a jungle gym than a straight, you know, rocket ship or something. Okay. Um, but there is a through line and then it's all about communication and words. I just love um, finding the threads that bring people together. Um, so I got a PhD in comparative literature. At first I was a professor, then I uh, became a journalist um, and then started working in this live event space, which I particularly love because there's nothing about people meeting face to face to do business that has a real power to it. I love building that community. Um, but I did take this interesting role in the philanthropic space the job was with an investment firm. So what they do is look after the funds for large nonprofits or families and grow those funds so that there's more money to give back to whatever cause the folks are interested in. Um, when I took that job, which was local um, to where I'm, I am in Colorado, um, I sort of had the impression that I was ready to step back from a more global business and take a back seat and just really invest in my community. Um, and what I found was I am like way too driven for that. So it like really quickly drove me completely insane to work at such a slow pace um, in a much smaller business. Like that's just turned out not, I misunderstood myself. Um, I like being with a, a slightly larger business, more entrepreneurial, more fast paced. Okay. Um, but that did give me great exposure to lots of people who were trying to, um, you know, build a legacy that is about giving back to others. But what I've discovered for myself personally is I like to do that with my own teams and give back to people in the communities that I'm working with, um, rather than being sort of uh, several times removed from the impact. Sure, sure. So what's your favorite book? Oh, gosh. I Okay. Okay. So, uh, so, all right. So probably many books and you love reading. Yeah. 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 My focus back in graduate school was like 19th century fiction. So I do love a big meaty tome. I've worked a lot with Dickens and Balzac and you know, like that. And, and I, I love that you're bringing that up because I think, and we're going to get to the cannabis industry in a moment. And I, I will share, I've never smoked or, or consumed a, a cannabis product, but having said that I am aware of the many benefits today, health wise and throughout history and much that isn't talked about because of how it has been portrayed in the media. So I love the fact that you're bringing a face to it and you're saying, listen, I'm deep, I'm intelligent. I, I have this broad knowledge in, in terms of stereotypes that somebody might have. I just, I love the fact that you're blowing through all of those right now. Well, and I think part of the growth that we see in cannabis now is um, just the total number and kinds of people who are in the industry. Okay. We just, um, the company I work for is called MJ Biz. We just had our big uh, annual trade show, which was 28,000 people in Las Vegas. And the kinds of people are so eclectic because everybody's interested both in the money side, huge growing industry, Correct. and in the culture side, all the benefits and the history of the product and so on. So um, like a great example of that is I got to do an Instagram live interview with little Kim. I know I Who's, saw you with little Kim, the rapper. So, yes. Yes. so it's just totally like not a thing that would have happened if I stayed on a PhD, you know, academic trajectory. So that was delightful. In fact, the first thing I said when I, when we sat down and the camera went live, I said, you know, I'm such a big fan and have been for forever. And she sort of like 
Well, you have fans in unexpected places. I was like, yeah, even like gray haired, cisgendered white women love the little Kim. Like, so I think it's a unifying, it's a unifying space. It is. And, and I love that you uh, refer to it as eclectic, because again, I think that, uh, you know, one of the things we chatted about before is it, it's not just one type of person. It's not just, it, it's like saying that only one type of person drinks soda, right? Yeah. And, and I think also like, um, you know, when you talk about being able to give back, I mean, there's the money side to cannabis. And I think that there's been some documentaries like on Netflix that have shown that it's not just like street kids. It's like major hedge funds that are now investing in cannabis and major in like people that, you know, see the opportunity uh, for a multitude of reasons. And also the celebrity culture. Yes, absolutely. I think Lil Kim um, embraces her femininity, whether people agree with how she embraces it. She's not necessarily going to be demure, supportive and helpful. Yes. Okay. Um, something else I wanted to ask before we, we move on uh, to the next question is when you worked in philanthropy before, what was the focus? Um, so because we were just looking after funds, it was people working in all kinds of spaces. So it was an interesting opportunity to see the various um, causes that people commit their time and energy and funds to. So some of my favorites are just such an eclectic group of people. It was everything from um, public radio. Okay. Um, so, you know, the importance of keeping local journalism alive okay. to um, a Headwaters Trust Fund, people literally buying property around Headwaters in the mountains here in Colorado to protect um, water rights and water flow and um, all that good jazz to, um, you know, people working more in uh, human support, so, um, people who make sure that people get fed or housed, or um, okay. you just realize there's so many, so many needs and lots of ways to focus your time. Got it, got it. Definitely in service to humanity. And so, so again, the bridge over to the cannabis industry was it that a door opened up one day, or was it that you had a personal experience where you had benefited from the the product? No, you know, the through line for me really is the, um, the skill in building content teams and doing communication. So okay. it's, uh, it was more the skill set that transferred. And I found myself in this eclectic space that's so dynamic and alive, again, both financially and from uh, the way it builds uh, sort of an eclectic community around it. Sure, sure. Wonderful. Okay. So let's, let's blow through some myths. So how is the cannabis industry today? attempting to reshape business from the inside out. So you had mentioned a moment ago that there was over 28,000 attendees at this Vegas conference. So it's definitely, I don't know if I would call it an underground movement that's now becoming more mainstream. Like for instance, family offices are talking more about cannabis. So, so how, how do you see it attempting to reshape business from the inside out? Yeah, and it's interesting because that flow is coming really from both sides. So okay. in the industry, you see a lot of mainstream people. Like really, I'm an example, right? Okay. Like I used to work in mainstream medical and pharmaceutical is a, another example. Um, so there's a lot of mainstream business people coming to the space as it's become more legitimized, you know, and, you know, legal, <laughs> but also with a lot of money. So we're seeing a lot of traditional consumer packaged goods. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, and let me try an ear set. Um, a lot of traditional consumer packaged goods people, um, people who were working for Pepsi, or for that matter, at our event recently, I met a woman who was working at Dow Chemical before. Yeah, um, yeah. So lots of mainstream investors, mainstream consumer packaged goods, mainstream um, manufacturing and processing, even mainstream big ag, mm. um, big agriculture, because, you know, the growing is for reals. Um, and I'm also aware that cannabis products are showing up in women's cosmetics. Exactly. Um, and that whole CBD space is a whole growing space for people who do salves and you know, all kinds of beauty products. So for sure, um, the mainstream coming in, legitimizing the space, and there's been a need for kind of both know-how in terms of um, like bringing things to scale. So okay. whether that's creating retail establishments that are in multiple states. Okay. Like that's that's a skill set that people have from other industries that's now coming to this space. Or it's building things to scale in terms of manufacturing and production. There are people who, 
you know, spent time building like an edibles brand, say, but they were literally doing it in their kitchen. So how do you take it from that to like something that's more, you know, you can do enough to satisfy the growing, growing need. Um, so lots of mainstream people coming in. On the other hand, where I would say there's an effort to potentially have impact on mainstream business from sort of the legacy culture of cannabis um, is there's like true commitment. <laughs> I don't, and not always um, coming to fruition, but true commitment to issues of social equity in this space. Um, specifically, there's awareness that this industry grew on the backs of black and brown people um, you, primarily. Can you, can you talk more about that? Because I think a lot of people don't know. Yeah, for sure. Um, and it's maybe a long story to tell, but I'll, I'll do my best um, to make it relatively short. So when cannabis, um, you know, it's now of course being legalized both in medical and in RAC, and we can talk a little bit about some of those numbers, but when it was still in illicit market, um, lots of the people who build, built that industry were black and brown people the result of the drug wars through the 80s, 90s, and even today is that a lot of those people were thrown in jail. So sure. our prison system is still full of particularly um, black men, but um, black and brown people of all kinds um, who are in jail for cannabis possession or use, or they had a small business or whatever. Okay. And as the business is transitioning now to be more mainstream, what's happening is we have a lot of white, big corporate, mostly men coming in and taking over the industry. Correct. So there's a recognition that that is like not fair. <laughs> we have a lot sure. of people in jail and not like that. Um, sure. And, and that's what one of the things that I picked up from this Netflix series that I had watched that like, for example, yeah. in the state of California, it went from being something that was underground in high demand to then becoming something like even the city of Long Beach had like a lottery and, and to even be in that lottery and participate was something like a million dollars or because it was generating now revenue for the city. So politically speaking, it was kind of like, where was the dime? Was it gonna help the, the counties and the cities and become a, a tax type of revenue source? Be it, and I just saw it, it like in the last, good grief like I don't know the last 10 years it's it was like legal on this in the state side kind of but not on the federal side and so it's very interesting that when I saw this Netflix special how much it's it's changing because of who is behind it and you're right it's not a fair landscape but at the same time I'm also aware of people who benefit from the uses and again it's not just you know for the pain that they're suffering from it could be like you know from cosmetics and drinks and hemp rope and you know there's a whole world now obviously 28,000 people showed up in, in Las Vegas because they also see not just the opportunity but the demand that it, it meets regarding customer needs in the marketplace yeah absolutely what's interesting is as states legalize they um and particularly because of the high capital demand, both to buy a license if you're going to be plant touching, um, as well as just a lot of people are interested in the dispensary space or opening a greenhouse. And you have to invest, you know, that's over a million dollars easy just to open the door. Correct. Um, which, given the socioeconomic disparity that's correlated to race in this country, okay. means that people of color. Um, often can't get access to capital. Like they don't have the banking, they don't have the mortgage, they don't they get have like all the privilege. Yeah. yeah. So a lot of the states literally set aside a certain number of licenses for social equity applicants, Okay. which is something you don't see in any other American business. I think it's fascinating. Like all those things are true of lots of businesses actually, right? Sure, sure. The, um, the, when, when the barriers of entry are too high. I wonder why that is. Can you possibly opine? Um, well, I think it's because of the history of this specific product means okay. that it there was disproportionate impact on people of color and people of low socioeconomic impact because of the war on drugs. Um, so it's a recognition of that. But again, it seems unusual <laughs> in in sort of, you know, late capitalism in the US. That's not how most businesses go. And there is an effort to do here. Now, that doesn't mean that most of the money still isn't going to big 
corporate um, and mostly white people, but okay. um, at least there's a effort, which is more than we see elsewhere. In other industries, sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think that does help in, in the sense of, um, you know, again, I'd like to believe that it's a play, plain, uh, equal playing field, but I realize that most of the time it's an asymmetrical playing field regarding who gets access to what, how they get access. And, and it's, yeah, yeah, it's, and I, and, and for the United States of America and North America in general, I think it's, a, it's been a very interesting conversation regarding what we're allowed to talk about openly as a culture and what we're, we're almost like shamed to talk about. And that's why when I went to look through your company's Instagram posts, it's, it's just fascinating to see how public policy is changing from state to state. Yeah, what, what are your thoughts with that? And then we'll move on to the next question. <laughs> yeah, it is changing um, state to state. And it's a funny, it's a funny business to be in because okay. most of the regulation um, is state-based and there really is no federal framework for it. Um, nonetheless, we're seeing lots of entrepreneurs build like multi-state operations to prepare for potential federal legalization. Okay. Um, it might be relevant to your question to talk to the growing size of the industry when you sort of put it all together. Sure. Um, so marijuana, like THC-based products, are legal uh, for medical use now in 38 states and DC. And the recreational or adult use market is now in 19 states. That means like 90% of the US population has access to legal THC. Okay. Um, super interesting. So at this point, um, we're forecasting that in 2022, retail sales will be over 32 billion, yeah. which makes it already larger than the NFL and soon to be on par with the craft beer industry. At the same time, interestingly, we're seeing a decline in alcohol use. In the, US. the meal crowd is just not that into it. They would just assume, you know, use a cannabis product. Part of what's um, diversifying the market and the use and sort of legitimizing the space, in addition to just the regulation, like, you know, it's legal, so that makes a lot of people feel safer about using it um, or even be open to using it. Okay. Um, like once you see retail shops popping up in your neighborhood, it just seems more normalized. Um, okay. So I think that helps a lot of people. Um, can I... The, uh can I just uh, for a quick second, because the connection dropped for a moment, you had said that alcohol sales are down. Yeah, Interesting. Over, yeah. Um, so I, we saw a spike during the pandemic for sure. I, I knew like, about that. Yeah. I knew the affluent went to their countryside homes and they drank. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but if you look at the age cohort data, okay. um, the millennial, like the kids who are coming up, okay. are just less likely to drink less likely okay. to drink beer specifically okay. um, um, and more likely to use cannabis because it's been part of their culture since day one. You know, okay. when you hit 21, it's not just go have a cocktail. It's let me go find a nice edible. I guess so. I, and I think it's also so fascinating to see how Generation Z and the millennials are changing the landscape in commerce it, it, across industries, whether it's the luxury industry to the cannabis industry, and I think also because they realize that perhaps the government won't be there for them, their approach to business is so much different regarding what they're willing to do in today's gig economy. Because it's not like it was 20, 30 years ago where somebody would work for one company like their parents did, and that would be like their entire life until they would, they would retire. Yeah, and to find work with purpose, which I think speaks to the work that you do. Um, People don't want to just have jobs anymore. We see that recruiting at our company. And I also, I have an 18 year old son and he, you know, he's just not oriented around career nor are any of his peers. They want to do something that has meaning to them because from their worldview, like, you know, the world could end within their well, lifetime. So like, absolutely. Point? Yeah. So I think that, yeah. that, and yeah, I think that worry translates into, I need to make the world a better place. So give mm -hmm. me meaningful work that honors my values. Cause I don't want to just be a mouse in a, on a wheel that is not contributing to helping this place if they feel like, yeah, I mean, that might be another conversation for another day, but yes, they're very aware of it. And so, yeah, okay. So is there anything else you can touch upon regarding the history of hemp or cannabis? Like I'm aware of that, uh, the rope 
rope at one time had been made out of hemp and it was incredibly durable. And then for whatever reason, it just disappeared and the US government kind of banned it. And Yeah, so the, the, the whole plant is so interesting. I mean, I think there's a lot of plants that have a lot of multiple uses that we barely touch in the US. Um, or elsewhere for that matter. We tend to grow crops for one purpose and one purpose only is sort of the uh, general thing. That said, the cannabis plant does have a lot of uses. So grown as hemp, you know, hemp is legal because you can grow it with low THC and then it can be used for rope. It can be used for clothing and other materials, other fab, uh, fibers. Um, it's even used in concrete. Yeah. Um, so, but what's funny is when it becomes like just another crop. Okay. Like you have pe farmers who have taken out soybeans, say, or corn and put in hemp, but now the market's oversaturated. So I don't know that there was some kind of cabal around it or something. Sure, like a it's monopoly the, or. Yeah, it's just the market forces mean that there's too much of it almost. There's almost, and there's even the manufacture of it for just CBD um, products. Um, it's an oversaturated market. There's too many brands right now. And so it's hard to figure out how to make a lot of money off it right now, but that's just an evolving marketplace issue. Yeah. Even on the more psychoactive side of it, I think it's something we barely touched. And um, another fraud issue where the, the tradition of cannabis and the mainstream part of cannabis are in useful dynamic with each other. Um, the chemical compounds that you can break cannabis down into that do have some kind of psychoactive impact, THC is just one of them. And so there's only rudimentary studies, I would say, of the, um, the way the body responds to cannabinoids that's still under research. Um, the pharmaceutical industry, as they become more interested in the space, and there is one approved um, is approved for, uh, for, for epilepsy um, by the FDA, but as people explore more, the pharmaceutical industry traditionally isolates just one chemical compound. Mm -hmm. That's important for consistency, but they want to isolate one thing, whereas a lot of the traditional use of cannabis for medical purposes is all about using the whole plant and using multiple compounds um, for the effect you're wanting. So that's another thing that's just sort of an interesting dynamic. That is interesting. And also I have heard that the hemp plant, if, uh, um, if, if it was planted around, let's say, um, Chernobyl or a site that has radiation, the hemp plant absorbs the radiation. And I, I don't know, again, if that's true. I'm not a scientist, but I found that also a very interesting fact that if it is true, then how, how useful is this plant? And we, we've only begun to scratch the surface. Yeah, like with a lot of plants, I think. You know? Yeah, yeah. But this plant, like you had said, it has a history of being banned, stigmatized. Yep. Right. Yes. Right. Okay. So, yeah, I, I don't know what the forces are behind that, but it's interesting now. I feel like in this day and age, as more truth comes out and, and, and it, myths become dispelled, we're able to, to peer in. And, and you're right. I think where people see an opportunity, they're going <laughs> to do their best to be first in the market. Right, right. Yes, exactly. So there is a podcast called Seed to CEO, and I haven't had the chance yet to listen to it, but what are some of the subjects that get discussed that are being, uh, that individuals are facing today, that they feel are relevant today? Is it watching an industry change in real time or what say you? Yeah, the focus of that podcast, each episode is an interview with a CEO of a major cannabis company. Um, and that includes everybody from people investing in the space to people who are have major grows. Um, it runs the gamut. Um, and so the focus, because so many people are trying to enter the space, it's an effort to educate people about how did you manage to grow your business to be a sizable one? So how did you grow it from a nascent business to be the CEO of a business that's now like a major player in the space? So those conversations include, um, you know, it's really focused on the business trajectory. So we did, for example, a great interview with Burner, who owns a really national, really global brand of cannabis called Cookies. Okay. 
Um, and what's so cool is he's figured out a way to basically set up franchises. So he's one of the first people in cannabis to really set up a franchise um, effort. And so he was talking about how does he maintain his quality okay. when in the end he has to grow the plant, process the product and have it be consistent from San Francisco to New York. Mm. So okay. the same sort of hurdles that Starbucks say or McDonald's oh, correct. had back in the day, but because um, you're growing a unique plant and processing in a way that, um, you know, you have to create those manufacturing processes and the quality assurance to go into that, as well as make the branding consistent, the store experience consistent. So that's an example of uh, a conversation we've had recently. And, and it's also, um, edu- it's good that it's educational to bring that real life experience to the listeners and to the viewers of what it's really like, because somebody can get uh, mesmerized by the dollar signs and not realize the amount of sweat equity that has to go into the planning and um, overcoming uh, obstacles like you had shared with uh, the cookie gentleman, that if he needs to deliver an experience at the end of the day, how can he make sure that that experience is um, consistent and deeply fulfilling and you know just as when somebody goes to McDonald's it's you know the happy place right the happy meal right so it it, and so just like McDonald's has to have a a process that's seamless um, he too is now discovering um, how to how to create and build that and develop that and especially when someone is a pioneer in the marketplace there isn't always uh, people that they can go to I mean hopefully they have a board that they can uh, go to in terms of uh, being advised, but sometimes it's just trial and error, and people don't know. They're like, maybe this works. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and we all know, like any kind of startup, it's more likely that you're going to fail than not. And so, yeah. having that kind of context, and especially in what is in essence a highly regulated industry, okay. in cannabis, there are so many things that are unique about it. The fact that even as you build a national brand, you need to follow each state's and regulations just for example like something like opening a retail shop and training your bud tenders on the local rules like if you get that wrong like you are in big trouble yeah um, there's all those to go on the package yeah. yeah 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 but it is big business and i think that's probably why the uh local and national governments and state governments have taken notice so let me get let me shift the conversation slightly so you have a heart for advancing and supporting causes for women Can you speak a little bit about that? Um, Yeah, for me, a lot of that um, um, is just expressed in a lot of the value I found in my own career and my own purpose is in, as I build my own teams, is helping support those women who are around me to grow their own careers. Okay. Um, So I so value being able to do that. I value... um, being able to set up workplaces that allow for that. One of the things that's became so clear as part of the pandemic is how women in the workforce are, you know, have that second shift for sure. (laughs) We saw a lot of women drop out because somebody had to do the homeschooling. Somebody had to take care of the kids when they're home. Um, And that's almost always the woman. So I, um, I really loved the moments where I've been able to talk to younger women who are working, who I'm mentoring to say like, here's a way that you can get through this pathway. Here's a way we can make your job more flexible so you can do um, multiple things during your day. Yeah, and I think women wear many hats, whether it's a regular business, whether it's a family business. And a lot of times those multiple hats don't always get recognized, you know, to, right, walk, right. to walk a mile in those shoes. So do you think it's that sometimes it it's, it's that they are invisible regarding what's required of them and then they get counted out because people don't realize what they are accountable to? Um, Right, so I think um, we have norms in US business or at least did before this pandemic and everybody working from home anyway. Okay. Um, We have this norm that you're supposed to show up and be like quaffed and um, you know, be there by 8.30, stay until six. And it's a little weird if you have to leave for the softball game or whatever. Okay. Um, which is unfair to um, everybody on the gender spectrum, frankly, but um, has particular impact on women's ability to feel like they're living their values when they have a career, because yeah. they have to they feel like they have to sacrifice all these other moments. Um, 
So I like building workplaces that enable people to not make that a division, but make that streamlined and to be able to bring their full selves to the workplace and their best selves, no matter what that looks like. Um, and I so love the generation that's coming into the workplace now where it's not just about like cisgendered women like me, um, but like all kinds of values. I think it really does benefit how the workplace can be more interesting and creative and beneficial to everybody. Um, so I value that. And um, I have been so pleased by the mentors I've had over the years who give me straight talk. And that's almost always women who like don't mince words with me. Yeah. I had a mentor once and I just love this story. It's like my favorite thing. And I like value this and try to do this. Although it may not sound that positive because it hurts when somebody tells you the truth sometimes, but it's the most beneficial thing. And it's so scary to do for someone, but yeah. I think, um, I've loved women who set it up. So I was once in this meeting and I was super young and I was like really upset about some issue. Like I wasn't getting the support and we need this. So like it wasn't going the way I wanted. And I was bringing all this negative energy to the conversation. And my mentor like stopped the meeting. It was like that thing you're doing right now, like you have to stop doing that. You see how you stop the conversation? Like you're just making people not like you. You just have to stop doing that. Be passionate, but not that way. And I was like, oh, like I was so embarrassed because she just said it in front of everybody. But um, I could immediately see um, what she meant. So um, I really like to do that for people. Well, she was <laughs> she was speaking to you in love, even if she yes. was, yeah, even if she might have been publicly humiliating you a tad by what I call the slap on the cheek. <laughs> yeah. You know, kiss on one cheek and slap on the other with a white glove. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I think in that moment, what you you learned is that women can do amazing things for other women, and, and right. they they need to. I think it was uh, was it Margaret Thatcher or Eleanor Roosevelt who had said, "There's a special place in in hell for women that don't help other women." <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I think what you're pointing to is that there is a, a great value that you see that you can and will and are bringing to women right, right now because you've walked that path of knowing what it is to balance raising children and then having to show up and be taken seriously at work and also not being able to talk about what it is that you experienced before you walked through the door. I know a lot of times in workplaces that are very structured, there's a message of, you know, leave your your identity or your full identity, your junk at the door. But yet, what if we bring, all, I'm not, not saying that we need to bring all of it in, but what if we bring who we are in perhaps that makes for a much more interesting conversation. And, and I'll share uh, something and, and I'd love your thoughts with this. I remember my first job at McDonald's, this was in Yorktown, Virginia. And, 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 and when somebody walked through that door, obviously they couldn't be racist, right? They're, they've got to put on their McDonald's uniform, but, but the moment that they took it off, they just went back to being their old selves. And I'm not saying that they needed to bring racist commentary into the McDonald's. What I am saying is what if some of those conversations could be worked out compared to stifled because now we're we're teaching people to be actors and actresses when they step onto what I might call the show floor of their workplace and yet their their full identity is not being evolved or transformed because nobody's having these conversations of well well this is how it 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 really is and and that person that you might see as so different why don't you get to know him or her because you've bought into a stereotype or an idea and it and it's not true. Yeah. So and I, I love the ability, we spend a lot of our days at work. So I love the ability of the workplace to help um, right make down. that diversity real. Like even the practice, which I you know am loving these days of you know using non-binary gender terms. Right. Um, I think like enacts uh, an equality, like it forces that conversation like you're describing instead of just leaving it on the sidelines. Like we're just gonna pretend we don't see that you are not presenting in the way that people used to present. We're just gonna turn a blind eye to that. Right. Instead, it forces you to address it and change your language and therefore change the community that you're living in. Yeah. Um, okay. I think that's great. Yeah. What, what are some of the values that you get to honor when you're doing your work right now, because I think it, my, my intuition is it was more than the money that had you leave the philanthropic industry to enter the cannabis business. Um, I mean, I do value being close to the impact I'm making. Okay. For sure. Um, I love being in the mix. 
So just in terms of like making career choices, that's something I learned about myself. I like that um, I can actually help women be promoted. I can make the changes in a workplace that make it more comfortable for all kinds of people to be in that workplace because I'm in a seat of power to make those decisions. And that has a real world impact okay. on who gets hired, who stays hired, who feels comfortable in the workplace. Um, in terms of the cannabis industry, I think um, I similarly have a seat to be able to improve diversity in cannabis. It is male dominated. In fact, at our event, it's like, and partly because it, like it is a party too, you know, when we do a trade show. Um, you guys there, are having there, fun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that means that all those issues of sexual harassment like come to the fore at like an after party and there's a lot of bro culture. So I'm in a seat where like I'm organizing the event. I can say like, we're not doing it that way. Good so I you. love being in the mix of, mix of it. In terms of my team. Can I interrupt I, for a moment? Yeah. I almost want to say it's like you're you're driving the narrative from behind the scenes. Right. Yeah. And you get to look at the landscape and the baseline and see all the different moving parts. And a lot of the times a woman's influence can be invisible. You, like you, you know, the wind is there by the effects, but you don't necessarily see the wind. Well, I don't have any problem shouting at the gale either. <laughs> I don't have any problem being front and center. But I think a lot of actual change comes from, you know, something as simple as changing our job descriptions to use like non-binary gender terms or something as, as seemingly simple, simple as allowing women to work from home more often or having flexible work hours. Um, like it has a real world impact, but and, and it's, giving, it's a structural question, not a like polemical question. So yeah, yeah let's have flexible work hours. Yeah, and I would also say giving validity to their experience compared to discounting it. Right. Because right, it, right. it, I, what I have seen in the last two decades in the work world is it's very easy to discount somebody else's experience because that person can't put themselves in those, that other individual's shoes. It's funny you put it like you remind me too. When I was uh, getting my PhD in literature, I was teaching also at the university's medical school because the thought was that reading literature creates that moment of empathy because you have to literally put yourself in another character's shoes. I mean, I don't know if that's true because every literature PhD was kind of drunk and mean, but <laughs> <laughs> I think that moment of empathy is a big thing for people who do communications, who do media, who do you know the kind of work that I do. It really is all about that get of okay. what, what is gonna move my audience. And I think it's the same thing with my staff and my team like what what is really in their hearts what is the motivating thing very nice what i and i had interrupted for what are some of the other values that you get to honor that somebody might not know on the outside looking in um, i would say transparency is something i value and something like this particular job allows me to lead from a position of like we say here's how much money we're making um, you know, here's where we see the growth coming in the next four months, um, instead of making that all be mysterious. Um, so that's a, a value I have for sure. Okay. That's wonderful. I think that business needs more transparency. And, and, and because then I think people behave differently. They're right, you're part of it, not just a cog. Yeah. Correct. Correct. And I think then people, uh, maybe are less secretive in terms of like that passive aggressive behind one's back type of, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I can also think that uh, street smarts are, are pretty valuable because in an industry that's changing very quickly and any startup, you have to read that landscape super quickly. Yeah. Yeah, not be afraid to fail. So that's another um, thing that certainly plays out well in this business, like try it and if it doesn't work, like if that's not working, let's cut it off. Cast okay. instead of clinging to ego. Yeah. We're just so, playing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so how would you define your legacy if you could yeah. give it some concise words? Yeah, ideally teaching people to um, have a work 
life that matches who they are. So hopefully that's true of my son as I orient his career. Hopefully that's true of the way that I can support the careers of the people who are working on the teams I've built. Okay. Um, yeah, that's the summary. That's beautiful. So something around, I would say, education and um yeah, that's lovely. I think find people, yeah, that thing that is most special about them and finding ways to express it in ways that are true to them and that they want to accomplish, you know, not okay. just learn how to be fit into something else. Sure, sure. Um, and I can imagine you also come up against some challenges. How do you find yourself, uh, you know, possibly working through those challenges? Is it role models that you may have come across before in your life? Or is it or what might it be for you? Yeah, um, I think that there are lessons about um, maybe two words, um, transparency and resiliency. So um, a lot of hurdles in the workplace have to do with like other people. Like in the end, it's just about community. It's about other people. Like the hard part isn't the doing the financing. The hard part is talking to the accountant and giving your, you know, making sure where you disagree or whatever. Okay. So I love the moment of transparency. Like I see you as a human. I understand. Like, tell me more about what you're trying to accomplish by taking the stance you are. Yeah. And then let me answer what I'm trying to do. And let's try to find the right way to cut through it. Um, Cause a lot of it is like that. There's been very few times where um, I think we tend to get outraged and there have been occasions where like something is truly unethical and I just have to like, put a line, draw a line in the sand and put my stake down. But most of the stuff that we get outraged about in the workplace, you know, is actually like, we just disagree about a minor matter. And so if we can see each other more clearly, it like the obstacles get overcome. I think resiliency is the other thing. It's tiring, <laughs> like life is hard sometimes. Um, and with that, just because we were mentioning before we started recording, we work with people who are athletes. A lot of the, I think a lot of my resiliency does come from athletics. Like nothing is harder than that last light lap of the cyclocross race. Like if I could do, this is nothing compared to that. Um, you just realize you're capable of more than you think you are. And yes. the value of rest as well. Like sometimes just walking away for an afternoon puts you in a much better position, makes you way stronger. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Um, that, that's lovely. And I think resiliency is important, uh, uh, whether somebody is uh, on that sports field getting berated and yelled at, or if they're in an industry that is um, creating new franchises, creating uh, a, a, a new narrative around cannabis, and um, overcoming even a history that is part dark, you know, as well as uh, you know, and useful in some ways. I mean, I'm sure it brings up a lot of emotions for people uh, across the board. Yeah, people do. I mean, the meaning that cannabis has had for so many people is so important and important to honor. And um, when things get in their way, like if that's, if you feel that kind of passion for it and you hit an obstacle, it's hard. So, okay. Yeah. If there's one thing that somebody could know about the cannabis industry and you had a megaphone, what, what might it be? Sorry to put you on the spot. <laughs> uh, how to make a thing. You know, I, I just think it's the, the opportunity for growth and the opportunity for disruption of norms in terms of who's in charge and the kinds of ways we build products and build norms, like the issue around social equity we were mentioning before. Um, I just think it has potential to be disruptive to some of the norms of the mainstream and to be hugely beneficial for people as well. Okay. Well, I, I do think people are seeing more and more that uh, this is an industry of demand. Like I have mentioned, family offices are jumping in and, and I'm sure a part of it is the return on investment, but I think another part of it is that this touches so many places in society today that it, it's no longer something that's a taboo subject. Right. Yeah, I'm, I've been watching how the products have evolved even in the short time I've been in the space. So, um, you know, there are now 
shopping experiences that cater to you know people who are older or women or who are first timers and product mixes that are catering to um, people. There's a, a brand called Wanna Brands that um, interests me because they've been rolling out formulas that are customized for specific um, uses. So they have um, a sleep product and a product they call Fit, which is meant to reduce cravings, like if you're trying to lose weight. Um, so it's just, it's fascinating how the people will find new ways in because it's no longer just about a giant, you know, <laughs> smoke experience <laughs> well framed well put okay um is there anything else you'd like to share including how somebody might be able to reach you or the uh media publication or the podcast is is there anything else you might like to share with the viewing and the listening audience yeah sure thanks so the company is mj biz it's all about the business of cannabis um so the main website is mjbizdaily.com we cover it's like a business um news publication and the trade show event annually in Vegas is called MJ BizCon. So you can find that at mjbizconference.com. Wonderful. And I'll make sure to include some of those links in the show notes. So yes. All right. Well, I would just like to say thank you for, for bringing you know, all of you to this conversation, your knowledge about the industry to educate others about, you know, both the, the good parts as well as the not so good parts that get swept under the carpet. And also that you are a real live human being as to this idea that people might have of, well, cannabis is just a male dominated industry. Okay, well, here's the lady executive. So uh, meet Pamela Moore, right? That's so, right. Great. Yeah, and, and I just also appreciate that you're speaking into legacy that, uh, that you care about the legacy that you are creating and that you want to be in service of, to other people. And you see the experience that they are walking, that they are going through and, and you're willing to bring you know, the wisdom that you've gleaned over the years to their path so that they can find the insights and not stumble and, and, and have a better, you know, life experience and uh, work performance than as if they were ignored or not seen and understood, not seen, heard and understood. So that's right. We're all in it together. And everybody together is better than everybody against each other. Absolutely. The world needs to be more connected today compared to the, the division that's out there. All right. All right. Well, well thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, please uh, like and subscribe and share with your friends and family. And until next time, please uh, keep defining, developing, and executing your life's legacy. Thank you so much for joining.